uh, uh, unique kind of multi-stakeholder partnerships uh, to address economic development and, and community development issues, things that I've done ever since I, I was in the Peace Corps. And it's been a great place to base myself. I have my children grew up here. I have grandchildren here. And I'm very fortunate that most of my grandchildren are here and haven't moved to the, to the mainland or, or someplace else. Um, and so I just got to a point where I got sick of, of kind of developing other people's communities and, and really wanted to focus on my own community. And so I, I, I kind of retired from my job of international development and, and set up this uh, institute about uh, six years ago was when I first incorporated it and uh, started trying to run it full time uh, about five years ago. But you know, most of my contacts and and my uh, uh, my experience even was really in developing countries. So even after I started the institute, I've been mostly consulting and uh, developing projects in South America, still in Africa. Uh, I have some ongoing projects now, one in South America and one in Papua New Guinea uh, that I'm still doing, which kind of ground to a halt uh, with the pandemic. And at the same time, for the last several years, I've been trying to kind of make more contacts and, and get to know more people. It's, it's kind of strange. This has been my home for many years, but my career, my, my work experience was mostly in other countries. And a lot of times I wasn't sure whether the experience that I had in agricultural development, economic development was applicable in uh, in a place like this um, and i think it's only in uh, maybe the last 10 years uh, that i came across some very systemic approaches to economic development that i feel work in any economy in any context uh, because it's not about like patented solutions to problems but it's a process that you go through to understand your problems and come up with solutions to address them and in the field of economic development, uh, in, in developing countries, there's a, there's a, a framework and, a, and an approach to economic development that I, I came across that really was a game changer in the way that I was doing it. And the places that I've done agricultural development are really challenging places, usually with a lot of conflict. And so, Whereas, you know, I, I know it's been a common problem here in, in Hawaii where people come from the mainland with very kind of patented solutions that may work in a different context, but are not well suited to the fact that we're on a small island in the middle of the Pacific and not in some kind of large landlocked uh, um, place. And so I, you know, I, I really felt that uh, there is a way of applying a lot of those, uh, those approaches, those system approaches here. And after talking to a number of agricultural development organizations, some nonprofits here, um, I've done some initial studies on, on um, agriculture and forestry on this island, and people have started to really embrace the idea of taking more of a, a systems approach, or, or what we call in international development, the market systems development approach to agricultural development in particular. And so the study that uh, I'm gonna kind of describe to you and tell you what we're doing is, uh, is an attempt to, to kind of use a, a more systemic approach to how do you improve agricultural markets? How do you create more income for farmers? And at the same time, how do you improve food security and food sustainability on the island? And I know that's a really tall order, um, and we're not going to be able to, to cover everything in this study, but it's, it's an approach and an, an attempt to start moving everyone in the agricultural sector a little bit more towards a, a collective action kind of approach. And for me, that's a, that's a very important kind of a, approach to developing any community, any economy. is, is just really... Um, a level of collaboration and cooperation that goes beyond the responsibility of one government agency, one nonprofit, one donor to kind of fix all the problems. And that's been a, almost a uniquely American approach to, to problems to assume that if you throw enough money at it or if you put a big enough budget towards it that you can solve it. But usually even if you have a, a, a big budget, what you need is a lot of cooperation. 
a lot of alignment, a lot of people working towards the same goal rather than one organization with all the money trying to make it happen through, through funding. So that's kind of a little bit of the background. And I have a few slides that I can explain about this uh, study that we're doing, which is really kind of the main focus of what I was gonna share with you today and, and how the Rotary Club can help. And I, I will admit that I don't know a lot about uh, uh, Rotary. I, I know that, uh, I, I don't know a lot about the structure of it here. And I haven't worked with the Rotary Club directly in the past, but I, I will say that one of the directors on the board of the Hamakua Institute is a colleague that I, from Canada that I, I worked with for many years. And I, I met her through a group called Washrag. Has anyone heard of Washrag before? Benson, it sounds like you, you know, <laughs> you've heard of it. Maurice, uh, I think, you, yeah. There yeah, you. yeah, it's part of a, it's part of an organization within Rotary uh, International that, um, that addresses water, water projects and water quality projects. And so uh, they, they are actually around the planet. So uh, in a very, very strong and influential group within, within Rotary. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's it. The, the, the woman has uh, been working in WASHRAG for many, many years, and she's a specialist in the field that's known as WASH, which is short for Water Sanitation and Health. And a big emphasis on water supply projects, but also in a lot of developing communities or developing countries, communities have really poor sanitation and a lot of uh, 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 various kinds of diseases and parasites uh, uh, because of uh, poor sanitation. So, so WASH is kind of that, that broad field and, and Rotary International had established this group and they worked very closely um, uh, with the foundation that I had set up in Nigeria looking at, at water projects and the woman who is now on, on our board and, and set up a, a water and sanitation project in Nigeria is, uh, is a close friend and, and colleague, and she's very active in Rotary International. And uh, is, is, you know, I'm, I'm sure if I, she finally gets a chance to come and visit here uh, from Ontario where she's based, then uh, um, I know she'll be interested to find out what uh, Rotary is doing here because uh, she's always been a very active member. So I, even though I don't know as much about what your club is doing, I just have to say that I really respect the sense of community and uh, the, the, the sense of uh, support and help that, uh, that it seems that you all provide. And the times that I do hear about what the club is doing, I, I, I just admire it. So I, I just, you know, um, recognition for all of you guys and, and, and for what you do. So maybe I'll just pause there for a second if there's any questions and then I'll just pop up uh, some slides to help you understand a little bit more about what we're doing with this uh, agriculture study. Yeah, uh, this is Doug Adams. I, just a quick question. Jeff Melrose, um, uh, before he passed, uh, about in the middle of the decade or so, put together an agricultural study, looked at the agricultural lands around the state. Um, are, are you building on that or did you participate in any of that? Uh, yes, we're trying to build upon it. And uh, there's someone now at uh, uh, UH Manoa who is, um, uh, is trying to update that study. And I, I did get a chance to, to meet Jeff before he, he passed away. And, and his uh, uh, land usage baseline study is still really kind of the most uh, comprehensive and definitive data that we have on agriculture um, on this island in particular. And it's the, the one thing that we say, what data is out there? That's the first thing that everyone points to. It's a really useful document. And I'm very excited that uh, the College of Tra Tropical Agriculture at uh, UH Manoa is uh, planning to, uh, is in the process right now of updating that study. Okay, are there any more questions? If not, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and kind of share the screen and uh, show some slides. I, I find it easier to talk to diagrams. So if you don't mind diagrams, I'm gonna throw up some PowerPoint slides for you all. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Um, can everyone see my, my screen okay? Yes. 
Okay. Um, so first, a, a little bit about the approaches that we take with the, the Hamakoi Institute. Um, in, in the last few projects that I ran as I was kind of uh, finishing up my, uh, uh, my previous job uh, in setting up foundations and uh, partnership projects, um, I, I really kind of had a chance after I stepped back from that to, to look at, you know, what worked and, and what was kind of the best approaches to development. And I, I'm really a little bit of a nerd when it comes to community development and economic development. I'm always fascinated with what works, what strategies, policies, approaches work. Uh, if you're designing a program, you know, what, uh, uh, what's going to make it successful? I, I've had a chance to design... Uh, I, I couldn't even count, maybe 50 or 60 different uh, projects over the course of my career, some as small as a $10,000 project. And, and the, the last initiative that I ran was a $90 million partnership um, with multiple donor partners in it. So it's, you know, I've always been fascinated with what are the approaches that, that really work. And that's what I really tried to put into this institute I started it basically to kind of uh, take what I'd learned and focus more on capacity building and uh, uh, analysis and training to help people, you know, really kind of get better at doing projects. Capacity building has always been kind of a, a key part of, of every bit I, I do. And, and it's something that they taught in the Peace Corps, actually, is one of the things that, that uh, stayed with me all of these years, is they, they trained us when we first went in that, your job is there to build capacity and leave. You know, you try to make the place better off and more capable of doing things than uh, how you found it. So the things that I really found that worked the best for us was, uh, this is kind of the motto that we use, think systemically and act collectively. And what that means is a combination of systems thinking and doing the right kind of upfront analysis and really understanding the system that you're trying to change and then working collaboratively with others to, to make that change. Anytime you think you can do it yourself, you're, you're gonna be climbing a long, slow path up the hill to get things done. The more that you can leverage your efforts with others, the quicker that things happen, and most importantly, the more aligned that people are along the way and, and not working against each other. There's a lot of um, examples of collective impact where you know, public and private uh, agencies and organizations are working together to solve problems, that those work. But one of the things that I found is they don't work so well unless they're based on some fairly solid analysis. And so this is really what we're trying to do with the, the study that we're focused on, is analyzing the agriculture system and analyzing the food system on this island in ways to better understand how they can be approved for more sustainability, for more profitability of the farmers to make sure that, the, uh, that they can survive and at the same time to focus on ways that we can improve our food security and not be so dependent on, on imported food. So what ended up happening with us is because people started to find out that we have been working on collective impact initiatives in other countries, they approached us about convening and facilitating the Hawaii Island Agriculture partnership, which was just set up last year. Um, the Hawaii Island Agriculture Partnership is um, what's known as a next generation partnership. The, this is a model that is uh, uh, getting popular very quickly in the U.S., where there's an attempt to put together uh, companies, business people, and uh, government agencies and nonprofits that are all kind of focused on the same sector and see how you can get more cooperation and collaboration towards some shared action items. And a, a level of cooperation that is meant to lift a sector in a way where everyone is kind of on the same page and working towards the same vision, rather than working at cross threads with each other. In the case of agriculture, there are many nonprofits, there are many government agencies, there is federal and state and county funded efforts going on. There's a lot of attempts to try to improve agriculture here, but they're not always aligned, they're not always coordinated, and sometimes they are working at cross threads uh, from each other. 
So when the Hamakua Institute was approached by HIAP to be the facilitator for this, the, the, previously the facilitator was based in California and uh, flying out here at a higher expense. So uh, when they found out that we already do this kind of work overseas, they asked if we wanted to uh, facilitate that here and asked if there was you know, some initial activities that we could get going that would help to support the action items that they already have in place. And that's really where the idea of an agricultural study came up. And so at first, the focus of this agricultural study uh, was on um, looking at the agricultural system. And specifically on behalf of the Hawaii Island Agriculture Partnership, so that could feed into the action plans of that organization. And as we're looking at collaborating for ways to improve agriculture, that we have the ideas that the study would get us all on the same page as to what needs to be done, uh, really kind of dig deeply into some of the problem areas that are seen as holding back the potential of growth in the agriculture sector. And so that was kind of the starting point for us. But then as we were starting into the planning of that, we also got approached by the county's uh, food coordinator, Sarah Freeman, uh, who coordinates an organization called the Hawaii Island Food Alliance, or HIFA. And HIFA and HIAP share probably about 80% of the same members. So there's a huge overlap between these two organizations. And, uh, you know, that for farmers that are producing food, many of them are a part of HIFA. All of the nonprofits that are focused on agriculture are present in both of those organizations. And so even if you're looking at food and you're looking at agriculture, if you're not looking at them at the same time, there's a huge amount of, of overlap if you do combine the data collection for looking at those things, even though we recognize that in many ways they're two different systems because our food system on this island includes an incredibly high percentage of food items that are imported from elsewhere on the island. And even of the agriculture that is uh, agricultural production on this island, a high percentage of that is exported and is not used for food production. And so these are, are two different systems and we're gonna look at the overlaps of those systems and try to find the integration points between the ag system on this island and the food system. And so you can see in this diagram here that we're trying to meet the objectives of both HIFA and HIAM by looking at the food system and the agriculture system together and having a lot of dialogue around what this means for both of those systems and then incorporating the findings from this study into the action plans for both HIFA and HIAM. So that's really the, the overall purpose of this and, and I can describe it a little bit easier if I show you this uh, strategic framework and particularly kind of focus on the five study objectives that uh, have emerged from the study based on the, the dialogue with both HIAP and HIFA's members. Um, the first one is there's a lot of interest in mapping these systems. And when I say mapping the ag system and the food system, what we mean is, is we have like a market system maps that help understand who are the market actors, what are the, the key functions within that sector um, and who's doing what in a way where you can better understand all of the parts of that system before you start narrowing your focus on a specific area that you're gonna try and improve. And so we are, are taking that kind of approach to looking at the ag system and the food system and producing diagrams that help people to understand that full system. Uh, we're also looking at identifying the infrastructure needs for value-added processing. Amongst HIAPS members, they've highlighted the need for a lot of small farms to access higher value products by getting value-added services to their products that will help them get into more profitable categories. Um, and as a part of that infrastructure, there was a recommendation within HIAP to establish an agricultural innovation center that may include different kinds of technologies and value-added processing available for small farms. The fourth study objective 
is to look at the gaps in the food system and opportunities for improvement through collective action and ways that uh, uh, we can improve food resiliency and food sustainability. And then the last one is to identify and review agricultural value chains with the highest potential to increase livelihoods. And, and this is an area that, uh, particularly for HIAP, that the Hamakua Institute will continue to focus on because value chain analysis and agricultural value chains is a, an area that uh, we're working in, in in a number of places and have kind of some strong networks of benchmarking data and uh, resources and examples that we can draw upon. So the outputs of this study, I mean, there, there may be one overall report where we'll pull everything together, but the key outputs that the grants that we've received uh, will be going towards is, you know, producing the, the geographic stakeholder and system maps uh, for the food and, and ag system. So some of them, some of those maps will be geographical, showing different infrastructure and uh, post-harvest facilities, for example, around the island. Uh, but there'll also be diagrams, process diagrams, to help us understand the components of a value chain um, or a market system and, uh, you know, where the different segments fit into it. We also be producing a feasibility study and a business plan for the Ag Innovation Center and then a set of plans for the County Research and Development Department um, that will emerge from the dialogue that we have in this study, specifically an emergency food plan, a food system action plan, and a plan for the establishment of a food policy council. And these are kind of already action items that county, the county has, but they're gonna use the, the study process to kind of inform the dialogue and come up with sets of recommendations that will go into those plans. So that's kind of a, just a, a, an overall explanation of the, the framework for the study. Um, and I can kind of go into a little bit more of how we're going about doing it, but maybe I should stop here and just see if there's any, any questions or comments so far. Uh, Doug again, I was waiting for others to come in if they wanted. Um, so I know that uh, council member Richards um, is, is taking a look at uh, the ranchers and farming there up on Kohala area. I also know that there is a Farm Bureau that's been stood up here in the Hilo area. Are any of those organizations participating with you? Uh, yeah, pretty much all of them. We, we have uh, uh, nearly 30 people on the uh, study planning and uh, analysis team that will be the, the stakeholder groups that are, are analyzing the data. Our job is to facilitate this study and to coordinate the activities, but the actual recommendations and the uh, conclusions that come out of it will be a collective uh, set of conclusions and recommendations with all of these groups in the study. So Tim Richards is uh, taking part in the meetings. Um, uh, we have uh, um, both UH Hilo College of Agriculture and UH Manoa. We have uh, the, um, the, the Hawaii Farmers Union. I, I think that uh, we've reached out to someone. We're still trying to uh, get their involvement. But most of the organizations that are involved in agriculture, both public and private, are, um, are involved in this. And those that are not actually participating in the analysis itself are people that we will be interviewing in either individually or in focus group discussions to get input as a part of the study. So qualitative data collection through interviews is a part of the data collection that we'll do. Dennis, is Kamehameha Schools actively involved? Yes, very much so. As a matter of fact, uh, 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 Leanne Okamoto from uh, uh, Kamehameha Schools Land Division is uh, uh, on the facilitation team and she's really the, the one probably most responsible for piecing together the funding for this study. Uh, so Kamehameha School is very actively involved uh, uh, in not just in, in terms of the providing input and helping with the funding, but uh, also in terms of connecting us to just about everyone that we need to. So yes, they are a, a very strong part of the study. 
Okay, I'll, I'll just kind of move on to the slides and please feel free to, to jump in. Um, I, I tried to, to keep the, the speaker screen open to everyone, but then it's hard for me to see the uh, um, uh, see all of the slides. So um, if someone raises their hand or something and I don't catch it, just feel free to, to speak up. Um, so yeah, I'll be I'll be looking out for that. If, if anybody has a question or whatnot, um, I'll make sure that you're you're aware. Okay. Um, all right. So the um, the next slide just helps you understand the process that that we're we're going through for this kind of analysis. And you know we're calling this a study, but it's it's a little bit of a misnomer because we are doing some analysis, but it's really a planning process. The idea is we're trying to make a very informed set of plans and looking at the data in a way where that not only informs our plans uh, but we can build upon it it's, it's something that uh, uh, in terms of sharing data and sharing an understanding of the ag system that we hope through the hawaii island ag partnership that we can keep building upon uh, patrick were you raising your hand or um, oh okay sorry um, so, you know, the, the idea is that uh, if you're trying to understand a system, um, you know, in my own experience in international development, for example, one of the biggest frustrations that I had, and I did quite a lot of uh, work, I never worked directly for them, but I partnered with USAID a lot, um, uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development. And, you know, one of the, the, the frustrations were that, you know, most funded projects that they would do, these big like 60, 70 million dollar uh, uh, programs um, were often kind of a solution in search of a, of a problem. They, they would be designed in such a way that they would look at a, at a, a, a model for development and, and a solution and then they'd go around and, and look for bidders to uh, put together a project proposal that would implement that solution. And you know th this is kind of what's known in international development as a, a blueprint approach uh, to development. In other words, you're going to come up with an answer, and you're just going to find a place where that answer works. And this is a you know it, it's a very inefficient way to actually develop an economy, and a lot of times it leads donors and government agencies towards highly subsidized approaches. Uh, to problems where you just kind of throw big money at a problem and most of that money doesn't even go at the problem. It goes to the people that say they're going to fix the problem. And if they don't, they still come out of it with a fair bit of revenue, but everyone else kind of loses. And so a much more kind of analytical approach to development, a very system approach has been used where you look at the a system and you look at the big picture you try to understand the whole system and then you start to narrow your focus on what are the key problem areas within that system and then once you kind of prioritize those problem areas you know how do you really kind of do a deep dive into them how, how do you understand the root causes of problems in a way that you can come up with solutions and so this is the overall approach that we're taking in the study we have a systems mapping sub team which is looking at the big picture and trying to come up with the maps and the diagrams that help us to fully understand the ag system and the food system and then we have an agricultural value chain sub team that's looking specifically at the problem areas within the agricultural system and another one focused on food that's looking at the problem areas within the the food system and so the idea is they're kind of looking from two ends of the same supply chain, one from the production end and one from the consumption end, but recognizing that things go kind of outside of that system. So I just wanted to start by giving you a, a, a sense of what do we mean by a system. And I've spent nearly my entire career focused on like uh, economic development. How do you develop from the beginnings in like small businesses to more regional economic development strategies? And so you recognize that if you're going to focus on helping that individual business in the middle, you can't just look at that business on its own. You have to understand the system that business is operating within. You need to understand what is the market system like? What, is the, what are the labor costs? What is the availability of land? What is the availability of capital? 
how much services are available in that area. And if you're in a remote island, you have to be even more careful to understand that whole market system because if you just look at the supply and the demand of the product alone, you're gonna be missing most of the elements that really are needed for a business to thrive. And you look at your market system and you, you look at all those components around it, but you're, you're looking with a specific intent in mind. And in the case of international development, and I think even in the case of economic development here, you're, you're not just looking at how do you, you know, how do you just grow that system? Because in some cases, and often if you're not careful not to do it, you're trying to grow a system and you end up just making like big farms bigger. You're not really spreading out the benefits of that growth to the people that need it the most. And so in international agricultural development, more often what we're looking at is this kind of this disconnect before, between the small farms, the small informal economy that might be selling in farmers markets and in, uh, in informal ways and they're, they're really in a, in a narrow corner of the market. And there's this formal large scale economy, uh, the big players that are there that, that, you know, that are important players to grow that sector of the economy, but you wanna do so in a way where you're connecting them more effectively with those smaller players and, and trying to grow the size of the pie, but in a way where those smaller players are capturing as much of the benefits of that growth as it can. And that can help to ease unemployment, and it can help to um, grow a sector in a way where it's inclusive. It's not just kind of focused on a few privileged players. And so when we're looking at that system, this is the kind of market system diagram. This is a, in market systems development, what we call the donut. And what it helps us to understand is, is if you look at that kind of middle part there, you can see the agricultural production and the consumption, and that's kind of the value chain or the supply chain in itself. But you can see all of these other functions, the supporting functions on the top. If you don't analyze that, if you don't understand the services, the availability of capital, the, uh, uh, the infrastructure that's available for that transaction in the middle to take place, from the farmer to the consumer, then you're missing key elements that need to be in place for, for those farmers to thrive and for those consumers to get a, a reasonable price for their products. But you also have to look at the rules, and this is where the policy debate is also very important. You know, and, and when we analyze an agricultural market in, in different places, we're looking at uh, what are the policies, what are the regulations, what is the legislation uh, that, that farmers and uh, that uh, uh, even processors and marketers are, are dependent upon within the value chain. And when we talk about rules, we're not even talking about you know, legal aspects, but we're looking at the norms. What is the norms of, of doing business in that sector? What are the assumptions that people have about how business should be done? And when you kind of look at that full picture, it, the idea is not that you're going to fix that full picture, but you're going to identify those prioritized problem areas that you can focus on and you recognize that if you're going to focus, say, on the need for infrastructure at the top end of that, uh, uh, of that little diagram, you, you have to recognize that if you make a change in that without making a change in anything else, the whole system changes. And, and that's why I got so interested in market systems development as, as an approach to doing agricultural development because so often I was involved in either designing a project or implementing a project where uh, we were fixing one part of a problem. We were putting a few pieces in a puzzle where there were too many other pieces that were missing. And the pieces that we put in had no chance of making a difference because we didn't understand enough of the other pieces. And so this is what we're trying to get across in this study. We're trying to help people to see the big picture and then to be able to do that deep dive into the smaller problems, but relate them back to how fixing that problem is gonna affect the overall system. I'll give you the easiest example. There was a fad for a while in doing microfinance for small farms uh, in, in international development. And there are a lot of agencies, uh, uh, 
donors that uh, would go out and fund these uh, finance programs for farmers without addressing training needs, market demand, uh, cost of input, so many other factors in that system that meant that just because they had the access to finance didn't mean they had the capacity to make good use of that finance. And in many cases, what they ended up doing was pushing farmers into debt without helping them to be able to service that debt. You know, so that kind of helped me understand that if you go in with a one, one solution fits all kind of approach, you're never going to hit the mark. And that's why so many efforts to try to improve agriculture end up failing because they don't look at the whole system. They just narrow in and it's like saying, okay, the carburetor is the problem in the engine. And if I fix the carburetor, even if, if the water pump is broken, even if the crankshaft is broken, that if I fix that carburetor, the engine is going to run better. And that's not the case, you know, they're, they're all interconnected and they're dependent upon each other. And so that's why understanding the system is that starting point for being able to fix it. So we're also recognizing though, that if we tried to look at the ag system and the food system as one combined system, that's where we felt we, it would be a weakness in this study to look at them in that way, because the fact is, that this little street map is just kind of a way to help us understand the concept here that of the, the agriculture production on this island, a portion of it is going to exports, a portion of it is going to you know, domestic purchases on the mainland, a portion of it is going to non-food products. And so you can't say that, that the two systems are the same. Similarly, within the, the food system on this island, a huge portion of what we consume is produced off island. And we can increase the amount of on island food production as much as we can, but we know that any kind of shorter term focus on the food system has to recognize the, the supply chains from other, you know, other parts of the world that we're dependent upon. And so what we're trying to use with this diagram is we're trying to put numbers to these arrows. We're trying to show what agricultural production on this island, what crops are going where, and what are the volumes, how many farms are producing them. And we're gonna also look at of the food that's consumed on this island, where is it coming from? And uh, uh, what, what processing is it going through along the way? Where can we capture some of that value locally? Where can we increase uh, the local production? And we're looking kind of for the spaces in the middle of that street map. How can we improve some of those arrows and redirect higher percentages of local ag production towards local food consumption? And what's that gonna take? So that's the overall approach of this study. And, you know, I, 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 sorry, I kind of given a lot of theory here, but uh, maybe I'll just kind of stop there. I hope I haven't gone too long, Maurice, but that's the, you know, that's the overview. And, Happy to hear what you think about it, and then I can say a little bit about where we're looking for help in terms of data collection. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Dennis. We uh, typically wrap up at uh, one o'clock. It's uh, three minutes to one. Um, if you guys have some questions, uh, and then um, you're free to ask now. Uh, I know Dennis has a little bit of extra time, so if, if you have some questions and want to stick around past the hour, uh, you're more than welcome to. But uh, I'd like to open the floor for anyone who has questions right now. It's Chemo Jim Becker. Can you hear me, Maurice? Yep, loud and clear. Yep. Okay, hey Maurice, thanks for uh, inviting me. I apologize for being a little late. I'm on the west slope of the Mauna Kea, so I'm, I'm out and about. But um, fascinating, Dennis, great job. Uh, I, I was involved with a organic farm project in Ecuador. We actually wrote two rotary global grants uh, because the uh, that that's where they they uh, they farm long stem roses and the bottom fell out of that a few years ago where they were having to produce them for two or three dollars a dozen. So the local rotary club stepped in and said if we could teach the local farmers how to do organic farming. Uh, we know that that would be a much more profitable and sustainable occupation. So same principle in East Hawaii, I think, could work with perhaps, uh, Dennis, do you think the, the Rotary Clubs could be a catalyst to 
bring together not only the agricultural community, but the education side of things and maybe facilitate uh, such an idea of, a, of organic farming as, a, as an alternative occupation in East Hawaii? Um, I think it's something certainly worth exploring. Uh, you, you'll find that generally when uh, uh, we're looking at different ideas, we always want to see, you know, we want to look at the numbers and, and see how will that work. For example, with, uh, with organic farming, I know there are a lot of people that are doing it profitably, but there are others that really struggle uh, to, to make it work. And that's always the thing that, that we have to look at is uh, um, the economics of any kind of uh, farming are never straightforward. Um, uh, originally, I, I come from a farming area in, in the Midwest, and I still have a, a lot of relatives farming there. And the business model for farming is changing. And the, and the, the, the kind of the, the typical family farm that uh, uh, I grew up around is, is uh, gradually kind of uh, uh, being replaced by larger corporate farms. Uh, um, you know, so, that's always going to be the question. If we look at different types of farming, like if you have the certification, if uh, if you can get the higher um, prices and, and a premium for organic farming to make up for the additional costs, you know, I think that a lot of people are doing that, but the, the dynamics are not always there. And, and uh, uh, like here in the Hamakua Coast, we... Uh, uh, We've been looking at a lot of opportunities for increased uh, um, ag production here. And, you know, when you start talking to, to farmers, there's a lot of challenges. It's uh, uh, cost of labor, cost of land, availability of water, availability of capital. There's a, there's a lot of common problems that, that people face. And so whenever we want to encourage or introduce something, we want to make sure that we have the numbers around it to uh, help people understand what real, what realistically can I make from this? What realistically is it going to take for me to make this work? Okay, much mahalo. Thank you. I guess we're out of time. Yeah, is there anyone else with uh, any questions before we uh, wrap things up? I, I, I did want to ask you, Dennis, you, you uh, had mentioned with the, the study that uh, there was opportunities for volunteering, that you uh, were looking for additional volunteering uh, or volunteers, uh, particularly for uh, maybe data collection. Uh, there was some phone surveying that could be done and whatnot. Could you talk more about that before we go? Uh, yeah, we, uh, um, we're still in the process of identifying all the, the data that, uh, particularly like macro level data, we're, we're working with the Department of Agriculture and using the, the National Agricultural Statistics uh, uh, database to get information. And we have also data services that we can turn to for, for benchmarking. But uh, for here locally, the, the, the big challenge is to get the kind of data that will help us understand um, where is there scope for more profitability, more growth, uh, 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 more food production. And that's gonna mean looking at different sectors like different crops and looking at the businesses that are either processing them or selling them. And so the data collection is really, you know, it, it's hard to get people to open up and talk about the economics of their business. It's a, you know, it's a sensitive issue. And we always treat that data anonymously, but it is critical for us to really understand where are the economic opportunities uh, for agricultural growth. And, and that is a key part of this market systems approach. If it's, if it's not gonna be viable, uh, we, we can't realistically focus on solutions that are gonna be just subsidized the whole way. At some point, it needs to be viable. And so as we do that, we need to dig into the numbers. We need to look at uh, what business, what margins that businesses are working on. We need to look at uh, who are the customers that they're selling to, where are the products going to. And so that's the kind of information through surveys and even more so through like interviews and focus group discussions that we will be looking for. And we're hoping that uh, through your members and the people that are already in some of these businesses, if they see the reasons why this are being done and 
you know, address the concerns of, you know, privacy of information and confidentiality of data, how we can put the numbers together to truly have an understanding of where the profitability is, where the opportunities for growth are, and um, if subsidies are necessary, and, and they usually are, they're, they're what we would call smart subsidies. There's a clear exit strategy. There's a, there's a way where if you're going to support a particular sector, a particular farm, a particular technology, that you have an understanding of how you're going to move that towards profitability without creating an endless subsidy. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Dennis, for coming and speaking. Uh, it's been very informative, and, and I hope you'll come back and, and speak again. And, uh, you know, open invitation, you're, you're always welcome to uh, meet with us and uh, listen to the speakers we have coming up. I'll definitely keep you informed and uh, look forward to working with you and uh, meeting with you more in the future. Thanks, Maurice. Sorry I took up so long of your meeting. I, I hope that, uh, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to just pass them on to me by email or even to call me at another time. Quite happy to answer. Applause all the way around. Well, <clears throat> that brings us to uh, the end of our meeting. Um, I will lead us in the four way test of the things we think, do, or say. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair at all concerned? Third, we'll build goodwill and better friendship. And fourth, we'll be ben beneficial to all concerned. And fifth, have fun. Have fun. Have fun. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Hello. Aloha. Aloha. Dennis, I have to tell you, your son and my son are classmates. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, knew your, I knew your last name sounded familiar, and I was trying. Now, which of my sons are you talking about, Nolan or Jason? Nolan, Nolan, Nolan and Nolan. Leon are the same. They, Nolan was over oh, at our house when he was at St. Joe back in the day. I was texting Leon. I said, we have this guy, Dennis Fleming. He said, that's Nolan's dad. <laughs> <laughs> as, a, as a matter of fact, I, I had met Leon, of course, uh, uh, years ago. Uh, he had to come to my house. Yeah. And so I had a meeting at Kamehameha Schools to, um, and, and they, oh, they just, they think the world of, of him. And, and uh, I mean, he is very impressive. So I'm sure you're very proud. And so I had heard so much about him from Alapaki and from Leanne Okamoto and, um, and so when he came and, and I, I'm, I'm just talking to him and he said, are you Nolan's dad? <laughs> it happens to me a lot. People know my sons a lot more than they know yeah, me. Yeah. Well, you were gone a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. Uh, uh, but uh, it's nice to finally meet you. And thank you. This is great. I told Leon I'm going to send uh, him this uh, PDF that you uh, sent us. Oh, thank you. I think this is all too. exciting and great on this, all these different things that uh, we're trying to get going out in Hamakoa with food security and agriculture and, and uh, trying to repurpose Kamehameha's lands from eucalyptus into something much more productive. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a lot of challenges and I know there's a, you know, there's no easy way to make decisions in, in Kamehameha schools. I know there's a lot of different opinions, particularly when it comes to the eucalyptus. We ended up doing a, a, a forestry value chain on that. And I mean, there's a lot of challenges in terms of the economics of different options, but just navigating through all the different opinions and ideas about what should be done is a, a challenge in itself. Um, but yeah, it, it uh, um, of course, we, we love this this place here, and it's just been so exciting for me to, to be able to focus my work here. I, I still kind of pinch myself because I'm, I'm so used to, for the work that I have to do to fly really long. <laughs> Since it, I had a project in, in Southern Africa uh, for the last couple of years, and uh, it was like 48 hours of flying time just to get there, you know, and... Uh, 
and and now that's what the pandemic has actually even done. Now they're more often they're saying, you know, we don't have to fly you over here. You can do a workshop on Zoom, you know. So yeah. I, it, it's working easier for that. Um, but please tell your son that I, I would like to reach out to him again. And, and uh, he is so so highly spoken of within Kamehameha schools. And, and like I said, you should be really proud. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Maurice, bye. Thank you, Valerie. Yep. So, uh, Dennis, moving forward with the um, um, the volunteers, um, what kind of timeline are you on for when you'll need volunteers? Do you have like a, a set number? Uh, like, how how will that process go? Well, we're, we're now that we've got the kind of the planning phase out of the way with last Friday's uh, meeting. We're in the process of kind of putting together the various templates that we'll be populating with data and, um, and how we're going to feed that back to the sub teams who will kind of look at a broader set of data and help us prioritize that to a more narrow set of data that will do a deep dive. And that will probably happen in, you know, in August, uh, probably by late August, we'll be at a point where we're gonna need more detailed information on specific things. And that's when it would be good, particularly if you have a lot of business members uh, within Rotary to kind of go back and say, hey, how can we, how can we share information that's gonna help you know, inform people, particularly about the problems that a lot of businesses have. So there, there is a value proposition for the people that are sharing information. It's not just a one-way thing. And so that's where we could use the help. And, and I'm thinking it would be maybe over a three or four week period that we would give you guys a set of questions to be asked and who we're looking for that data from. And if you have a team of people that would be willing to volunteer to do a few interviews and maybe some focus group discussions, we'll give them some guidelines as to what questions to ask and uh, how detailed to take the notes. And then we can collect the, uh, um, or in some cases where you have someone that maybe has a strong network of contacts that are willing to share information and they can kind of be the convener and we'll come in and actually take the notes and, and uh, uh, ask the questions. I say we'll come in. I'm, I'm having to, I'm still working on the assumption, I guess, that I have to do this all over the computer. And, and this is kind of new for us, too. We're used to doing this all in face-to-face -face workshops. Yeah, I can imagine. A lot of adjustment. So I guess what I can do is, as we're kind of putting together the data collection plan, I might reach out to you again and, and to say specifically, these are the kind of questions, these are the kind of businesses. I have some sense of that now, but I can give that to you in more detail in the next few weeks. And then maybe uh, um, if you have some people that are willing to help collect that data, we can put together a, 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 like a spreadsheet that will identify who needs to be interviewed, who's willing to do those interviews and, and take the notes and what kind of protocols will we put in place to get that data back from. Perfect. Yeah, that sounds great. I, I know that um, several members of, of Rotary have already told me that they're on board. They, they would love to help out, especially if it's a matter of uh, you know doing phone interviews and or using their contacts to to find people uh, and or or push some of the business owners to uh, share information. So um, yeah, hopefully uh, hopefully that will be fruitful on, on our end. But we we definitely will work hard. Well, and and if you you have a broad membership, you know sometimes what are the best most useful kind of data collection points is if you can get people that, that are in a particular sector together into a focus group to talk about their problems. So if you have a, a group of members, for example, that are all kind of uh, in some kind of a processing or maybe they're restaurant owners or, uh, you know, run small retail outlets that sell food, if, you know, it's always more rich in terms of the input when you can get like a, a group of people that, that all have the businesses to sit around and talk about the problems that they have because you usually they rarely do that. But if you convene them together, they start to find out things that they didn't think of and the, and the discussion is just really useful for everyone. I agree. Yeah. Well, uh, I look forward to, to working with you and um, you know, really thank you so much for, for uh, making the meeting today. 
No problem. I'm happy to, to help and look forward to working with you in the future. Okay, awesome. You have a wonderful day. Be in touch. You too, Maurice. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye.